Act After the Ape by Stephen Volk. It was difficult for her to function with any kind of normality, not when her lover was lying below, crisscrossed by ropes like Gulliver, people hacking out the inside of his body like whalers from Nantucket. She'd taken to having a first cigarette while still horizontal, sucking in her already sunken cheeks, drifting into the penumbra of being fully awake. The morning newspaper was always lying outside the door, but she didn't read it anymore. Always full of stuff she didn't want to hear, stuff that made her feel angry and sickened. Him, herself, the lies, the legend, the jungle. What did they know about the jungle? They hadn't been there. None of them had. In time, the salty soreness of her tears compelled her to sit up in the cold of the hotel room, icy shoulders trembling, tiny arms frozen and white. Doll eyes stared from the mirror. She hadn't set foot outside for how many days now? How many weeks? She didn't care. The room was safe. She was untouchable here, alone with her menagerie of thoughts and memories. Sometimes she wondered if she left or was made to leave those thoughts and memories might remain, like ghosts. Her misbegotten soul haunting the building of her physical body was wheeled away on a gurney. Nothing left of her but a soft focus studio publicity shot, an obit in variety. Somehow she knew how the headline would go. What did they know? They knew shit. That was the Bowery girl talking. That's what she was, after all, down to her raggedy ass bones. None of the glamour and pearls and platinum curls of Hollywood could cover that up for her in the end. Once a bum, always a bum. She unscrewed the cap from the bourbon, Papa's favorite. Prohibition, joke. There were ways. The tumbler told her it, it hated to be half full. The numb, plummeting wash of it brought up an acid reflex that hauled her monstrous hangover with it, dispelling any faint illusion her head was clear. Still, she was grateful for a taste of oblivion. Oblivion was her prime concern of late. Any other concern, eating, sleeping, dressing, fell poor second. What could you do when the hangover felt like it would kill you? Keep drinking. Truth is, she barely even tasted it anymore. On her wrist, a gift from a producer who had a taste in watching instead of doing, said 11.45. Hell. Not that she'd missed anything, just that so much of the goddamn day loomed ahead of her. These days, she despised being awake, because being awake meant thinking, and thinking meant remembering. Twig figures, <coughs> twi twig fingers tweaked at the drapes. She knew sunlight was going to be painful on skeletal skin, and managed to let a gap of a few inches illuminate the scrunched up sheets, the full ashtrays, the dirty glasses, the scattered shoes, the half-hung clothes, the latest Paris fashion fur coat strewn on the floor, where it would lie forever if she had her way. Fur. Those insensitive bastards at the studio. Fur. Last time she listened to the radio, it was saying they were giving tours of him now, taking folks on tours inside him now. She pictured his chest cavity lit by strings of lamps like Jewel Cave in Custer, South Dakota, she remembered visiting as a frightened, inexpressive, barefoot child. She knew they'd take out her insides, too, if they could. The birds of prey of the Herald and Times, the graveyard worms and rats in raincoats with underwoods where their morals should be. The story. It's all about getting the story. And the story was her. And sometimes in the darkness of night and nicotine with the shakes and spiders, giant, huge, it was oh so appealing sometimes to say, here I am, you sons of bitches, do with me what you will. Here I am, chained, naked, shrieking, and then it'll be over and I'll have peace. This wasn't just about her. It was about the special thing that she and her lover had found and lost in a heartbeat, a great heartbeat like a jungle drum. It was that they wanted to stamp all over with their dirty thoughts and bad jokes and fabrications, and she wouldn't let them. It was too precious, too rare, too wonderful, too strange, too romantic, too scary. She wouldn't let them abuse it, and she wouldn't let them have it to do with as they pleased. It belonged to her. It was all she had left. That and the feeling as she slumbered that once again her lover's giant fingers were closing warmly around her body, she was safe again. It was the one thing, the giant thing they could never, ever destroy, not with airplanes, not with anything. She heard the beeping of taxi cabs from the street far below. The traffic was moving. The traffic always moved. She wanted to open the window, but she daren't. The streets of Manhattan still ran sweet with blood. The oceanic stench of decay. A graveyard upended, said the radio, hung heavy in the air, even as the lumberjacked and slaughter men changed shifts day in, day out, 
Nothing could be done to, to diminish it. It was a brave tourist indeed among the throngs of sightseers from every state in the Union who wouldn't hold their nose or cover their lower face with a handkerchief when viewing the colossal remains. This wonder of the world, this hairy giant, this Goliath slain by David. Goosebumps rose on her arms. She picked up her dressing gown embossed with the hotel's elaborate crest and wrapped it around her shoulders. It gave her the warmth of a surrogate embrace. The bourbon, telling her don't be shy, gave her another. It didn't improve on the first. Instead made her feel sour and queasy, mingling with the disquiet she felt in her nerves and far from acting as an anesthetic as she prayed, made her even more anxious with the hermetic silence of the room. Not suddenly, but with conviction, she realized that the very real possibility that she'd go mad here, be carted to the nuthatch, or end up howling at the wallpaper, or running out into Fifth Avenue, half naked like Mrs. Partigan, who lost her brain and took to going shopping on icy winter nights wearing nothing but her undies, would be chauffeured home by Raleigh Absalom, the local deputy, to admirably sanguine regularity. That was in Marshall, Nebraska, where she grew up, cold and unhappy, raised under the jurisdiction of her Aunt Jelly after Ma's last illness. She wished she'd seen her mother before she died, but Bryce was on the scene by then, and Bryce and her didn't get along. It was like saying the war in Europe was a difference of opinion. So doll-faced, porcelain, and pure skipped off school, never did like it, got beat a lot, and hopped on a cattle train to New York like a hobo. But her Ma was already in the ground, and Bryce was damned if he'd pay the return fare. She earned that singing on street corners and in various other manners, with a pair of goodish legs and a singing voice that got her by. It was a tough climb. Mostly she counted herself lucky if she made it to the soup kitchen every day. Hoofer, chorus girl, arm candy for a rich guy. Good time Annie for the distracted and misunderstood. Wasn't too choosy. Couldn't afford to be. When you slept on a doorstep in the pouring rain, you didn't ask to see a resume. If the collar was clean, if there was a collar, the fellow wasn't plenty, was plenty good enough for you. For a night, anyhow, especially if he was paying for a bed. They started saying she should be in movies. She heard that so many times it turned out to be true. She was good at acting every day of her goddamn life. Tired of her own prehistory, she sat on the side of the bed and rang down for room service. The hotel operator's voice was chirpy and infantile, making her wonder if the girl was retarded. Nobody could be that happy. Guess maybe she was on the on the hour on the bourbon too. She had a difficult time with the words, so she stayed monosyllabic. Ham, bread, eggs. The girl repeated back her order, making it sound much more coherent, and said it would be twenty, twenty five minutes. Is there anything else I can help you with, ma'am? The actress spooled through a list of requests in her mind. A life, happiness happiness, but said, No, just that. Hung up, thinking, did she know? Of course she knew. They all did, probably snickering up her sleeve right now, calling her boyfriend, eager with the gossip. Guess who we got staying? No, guess. The idea of food made her think of the slabs of meat being shorn off her lover's, lover's corpse. The two man saws at work under the same hefty spotlights, the studio wheeled out for the big night at that Broadway theater when he was shown to the public for the very first time, before all hell broke loose. She thought of the massive stakes being packed in ice trucks sent to the deprived, the poor, the needy. There were placards out there saying it was as near as God to cannibalism. The hungry didn't care. The homeless didn't debate. The jobless didn't grumble. Her lover had died and his flesh was being used to feed the poor. There was something desperately Christian in that, but wholly blasphemous at the same time. When it came, the knuckle rap on the door was brisk, snapping her blank stare. Another glass since the phone call, pointless but effortless, she tucked her breasts inside her robe and tightened the belt with a tug. By the time she opened the door, her fringe had drooped over one eye, her belt had loosened, and her left tit was about to poke out and say howdy if she hadn't rescued it. Focusing before her stood a kid with short blonde hair, his ears grazered islands on the side of his head, standing to attention like a marine. He wore the white jacket with the horizontal epaulettes that was the hotel staff uniform. First impression was the whole guy seemed as starched as it was. Black slacks straight as ramrods black polished shoes at 6.30. The whole package made her feel even more sluttish and trashy. Come in. The clockwork soldier entered with the tray. Where would you like, please? She waved indiscriminately. Anywhere? Very good, ma'am. Clipped. She tried to pinpoint his accent. European, for sure. Hungarian? 
She should be able to tell plenty of those at the studio, fleeing the old country, fleeing their wives too, mostly. Now he was running out of ideas, she could tell. Anywhere you could find a space. He balanced it on a footstool at the bottom of the bed, uncertainly, and wiped his hands on his behind as he backed away. She looked at her purse and spilled out some coins, picked up a few with her thumb and forefinger, and daggled them towards him till he held out his palm. He nodded his thanks for the tip, and swear to God, a click of the heels went with it. In the mirror, she'd seen his eyes on the bottle of ruin. As his hand touched the door handle, she said, Can I interest you in an illicit beverage by any chance? The kid turned back, painfully polite and not a little nervous. Thank you, but I do not drink. Eyes anywhere but on her. You mean you don't or you won't? His cheeks flushed a little red, which she thought was sweet and a curse. A display of his unworldliness, which must be a burden to carry into adulthood, poor sap. Kind of affliction. Come on, live a little. You're a long time dead. You don't get any prize in the hereafter for being stone cold sober. Not according to the churches I go to. I'm sorry. I should explain. The hotel, yes. I will be in a lot of trouble. In the USA, this is against the law. No kidding. What law? The law of the jungle. I'm sorry. These are the rules. Well, get the lead pipe out of your ass and enjoy yourself, kid. What's the worst that can happen? Nobody will know. I won't tell. Promise. She put on a Shirley Temple voice. Cross my heart and hope to die. She genuflected and he noticed her fingernails made little white lines in her skin as they brushed it just above the bra line of her nightgown. Her skin seemed soft and still had the sheen of sleep. He looked away. Turning from him, she filled her glass, then turned back to him and drank from it as if demonstrating the procedure. He looked at the coins in his hand and put them deep in the pocket of his slacks and didn't leave. She thought he was holding his breath. and Maybe he was. She sat on the unmade bed and crossed her legs, positioning the glass on her knees. The hem of her nightdress rode up her bare, sh shaved calf. You're German, aren't you? He made an apologetic face. My English is not so good. Ditto. She smiled to put him at his ease. You're doing fine. She wanted him to smile back, and he did. Where are you from? Bavaria, Munchen, Munich. He pronounced it Munich like something you'd scratch. In the south, close to the mountains. Yeah, we got those two. What's your name? Peter. Peter, she repeated. Hi, Peter. Aged about 18, she guessed. He had a good 10, 12 years on her. She liked that. She liked the young. There was something optimistic about them. They didn't know what was to come. I better go. No, stay, she said. Talk to me. He laughed uneasily. You are a very nice lady. I don't want to lose my job. You won't lose your job. I'm a guest. You're attending to the requirements of a guest. You won't lose your job. Sit down. Relax. Oh, please freaking relax, Peter. Her language shocked him. That wasn't the way women spoke. Not what he was used to. It was another thing that surprised him about America. It made him feel a little sickened and a little excited at the same time. Okay, I sit. He could see what was attractive about her. Even now, here in this state, like some bedraggled bird with a broken wing, she had some quality. Downstairs, he'd wondered if he would be able to tell, tell that by meeting her. And he could, in an instant. It was true what they said, and they called them stars because they shone. What do you want to talk about? Oh, surprise me. Arms that propped her up slid down the bed. I haven't had human contact in seven days. I'm adrift. I'm shipwrecked. Do you know what shipwrecked means? Of course. On an island. In stories. She rested the glass on her forehead. Not just in stories, baby. Baby was an American expression. He told himself she didn't mean anything by it. It was a term made by a boyfriend to a girlfriend in this country. It was strange, but it was okay. Have you ever been to an island? She asked. America is an island, he said. A big one, but an island. That's not what I mean. She flipped ash onto the carpet. I mean trees with coconuts on. Big green leaves as big as this carpet. Beaches where no white man has ever trod. Get the idea? Tribes with plumes in their hair and bones through their noses who live in fear of their god. 
who sacrificed humans to him with the beating of dinosaur skin drums. She sipped her poison, her eyes not leaving him the whole time. That kind of island. The kid didn't know how to answer. Instead, he looked around the room, away from her, as if taking it in for the first time, or pretending to. You like this hotel? Oh, it's peachy. Took a step toward the door. I can get you something, perhaps? Sit down, for Christ's sakes, Peter. I want company, that's all. I'm not going to eat you. For some reason, she laughed. For some reason, this tickled her, and she said it again while she was still laughing like a mule. I'm not going to eat you. He smiled so that she didn't laugh alone, but he didn't know what was so funny. He looked at her where she lay. Her flat stomach under the silk nightgown shook with mirth until she felt foolish and ceased. He was still looking down at her in silence, and she let him. The room was dark. Sirens broke the air like wild beasts in the distance, made them both remember where they were and why. He coughed and moved to the curtains to open them. Don't do that. People can see in. I don't want them to see in. Talk to me. She bent her elbow to prop up her head, moved the glass to rest on the pinnacles of her hip bone. Talk to me. What do you want me to say? She cocked her head to where the light was trying to get in. Tell me what's happening outside. Outside? She took a mouthful of liquor and swallowed. What's happening to my lover? She blinked her eyes once dreamily. Wasn't sure if it was the drink. She looked very sad and alone. Couldn't remember ever seeing anyone looking so sad and alone. Eyes hid back in their sockets like his grandmother's eyes. Tell me the truth. I can take it. Her breasts were tiny like a girl's, and the space created by the fall of the nightgown was too big for them. Afraid to go closer, touch her, break her, lean back against the wall as if, if he pressed hard enough, he might escape. But did he want to escape? A pencil line of sunlight from behind the drapes cast down his cheekbone, his throat muscle, one bicep, one golden button. The rest was in shadow. The traffic is flowing again, he began. People are returning to work. President Franklin D. Roosevelt said in a speech yesterday that this great city might be bloodied, but was most certainly unbowed. He raised a fist, but she didn't look at him, and he wasn't sure she was listening as he spoke, but he spoke anyway, as he'd been bidden, hiding the fist again self-consciously behind his back. They, they are writing names on the walls of buildings, the relatives, parents, husbands, wives, writing the names of their loved ones, the ones who died in the slaughter. He saw her flinch a little at the word and kept his voice low. There, there were many, I think, over 70 on the subway train alone. Many, they say in the bulletins, are missing. Still, what are the words? Unaccounted for. The parents and wives and sons sleep on the street now, asking anybody passing for information. For hope, I guess, or peace when the bodies are found. It is a funny word, peace. For a moment he was lost for something to add. He looked at her face as if it might offer him a hint, but it didn't. The rubble from the destroyed buildings has not all been removed. The trucks come and go through the night, but there are hills that do not seem to get smaller. It is a huge job, of course. The public services work like crazy around the clock to make stable the buildings they think might collapse and cause more destruction. Oh, and dust. Yes, dust still hangs in the air out there. It doesn't go away. It clings to your clothes. You go outside in a black suit, and in five minutes it is white. Even funerals look like they had been sprinkled with, with icing sugar. Figures from a candy shop. It's not right. He shook his head. He looked up. His jaw was set. Meanwhile, the giant, he pays the price. The authorities, they're cutting and peeling off the skin from his arms in long strips, rolling it up like carpet, taking it away to turn it into leather, so the rumor goes, for use as an upholstering in government limousines. I don't know if you should believe the rumors. He wished a little more light would fall on her, but it didn't. There is a beggar, he said, filling the silence, a bearded old Ashkenazer who sells souvenirs outside Macy's. You know, the wind-up monkeys who play klish, klish, not knowing the word in English, he, he mimed, clapping his hands. The toys? He nodded. He has taken the klish, klish off them, so they look like little replicas of the monster opening and closing his arms. 
But if you look closely, you can see the little holes in the middle of their hands. I talked to him about the attack. He just shook his head and said, it's biblical. It's biblical, he kept saying. Memory returned to him, and he recounted it quickly and with enthusiasm. Yesterday, when I walked past the scene, I saw a gang of children bouncing a basketball to each other, then tossing it high in the air, trying to get it to land in the dead beast's nostril. Younger kids on a dare, plucking out the monster's hair. Took quite a tug, I could see, flicking them at each other like bull whips. He chuckled. The actor said nothing and hardly moved. She wasn't chuckling. He could tell that. His heart tightened in his chest. In the kitchen, they said it was you. I didn't believe them. She looked up. Do I look like the photographs? Aware of her appearance, she swiftly added, don't answer that question. He laughed, shook his head in disbelief. I am in the same room as the woman who was held in the hand of a damn monkey. She lit a cigarette and left the packet sitting between her legs. He wasn't a damn monkey. He was a damn gorilla. You could see the curve of her thighs so clearly it was as if she was naked. He wanted to feel the silk and feel her skin. If it was cold, he wanted to warm it for her. If she was cold all over, he could hold her to his body. He was not cold. Are you German? You look German. She ran a hand through her curls and laughed. I got news for you, kid. I'm not a natural blonde. He blushed to his bootstraps. Greek Scottish on my father's side, she said. Norwegian English on my mother's. Coat of many colors. Bella, she's a Pole who works downstairs washing dishes. She went with her sister and brother-in-law to see it. She was very excited. They all were, hopping up and down like they were going to a Broadway show, wrapping up in their sl- sleet, in their scarves. She thought it would be somehow frightening, like a fairy girl, like a fairy ground ride. Fairground, fairground ride, he nodded, like Coney Island. Go on, she said, it wasn't, it wasn't at all. Eyes downcast, he looked unsure whether to continue. When she came back, she was real quiet, just put her frozen hands in water and got to work. Later, I asked her what happened, and she said the head of it was as high as two tram cars on top of each other, huge, as big as a house. You could live in it, she said. Don't give them ideas, the actress thought, blowing cigarette smoke and waving it gently from her face. They looked up and they saw something catching the light. They couldn't work out what it was. Big, glassy, round. Then they realized it was a tear, frozen, turned to ice on the creature's cheek. Big as a glitter ball in a dance hall, they said. Like I say, they weren't laughing. They came back, like I say, real quiet, he shrugged. Then the kitchen got busy, hundred covers. He didn't have time to think about it after that. I don't know. What else don't you know? He looked up. Sorry. What else? He sighed. <sighs> Captain O'Rourke and his men, the pilots of the biplanes, had dinner at the White House. He heard her make a little snort of disdain. Well, they are heroes, no. They risk their lives for the sake of the motherland. They didn't die. He did. The enemy. Enemy of what, exactly? I'm sorry. I don't understand. Shivering, she picked up the fur coat from the carpet and wrapped it around her shoulders. Did you see his silhouette against the sunset? He shook his head. Then you don't understand, she said, without any note of accusation, hardly louder than a whisper. Her throat was dry and needy. She struck a match and the lit cigarette dangled from her pale, dry lips, its tip bobbing as she spoke. Tell me about you. You have a family? In Germany. I will tell them I met you. Uh Uh-huh. What will you tell them? You are famous. I am now. You are pretty. She laughed into a cough. Once upon a time. This room sure is dark. She wanted to ask him, was I pretty before I was famous? Do you have a girl, Peter? Sisters? Three? That's not what I mean. Sit next to me. You're a long way away. Can't see you over there in the gloom. When he did, she patted the mattress next to her for him to move closer, then did it again for him to move closer still. She placed her hand on his thigh and saw him shudder. Is my hand cold? Am I cold? He shook his head. She put it to his cheek. Will you take a drink with me? I don't like drinking alone. 
He didn't say no, so she held up the bottle of bourbon and pressed it against his lips. She tilted it up like it was a baby's bottle. Without moving his body, he took a mouthful and swallowed, and the bottle was taken away with a sucky noise he gulped air. That's it now. You lose your job. You smell it on your breath. You've broken the rules, chum. I don't care, he said, tugging the bottle from her and swigging from it a second time, longer and deeper. She was astonished and had to take it, snatch it from him before he demolished the whole bottle. Greedy little, down the hatch. What's it for, eh? Booze. She stared at the label. It swam. Just a way to get back to the animal, that's all. When you think about it, look at us, human freaking beings. We got hundreds, thousands of years of freaking civilization. We got intelligence and progress coming out our ears. We got motor cars and fashion and society, and welfare, adding up machines and rotivators. And what do we need? When a man and woman get together, we need something to evaporate all that, to get us back to the jungle, to wipe out history, to tear up books and wisdom, shed William Shakespeare, Homer, Jesus Christ and Henry Ford, Abraham Lincoln, Greta Garbo, Thomas Edison, to be what we were, our animals. She rose to unsteady feet in the middle of the swamp of sheets and pillows. What's a bed if it's not an island in the room? The island where we return to the past, the scary past, the exciting past, where we live or die on our instinct, the blood pumping in our veins, not the whim of some bank manager or casting agent, with the mercy of the beasts that can eat us or save us or take us or raise us up to the shit, the heavens. The bed undulated under her. He laughed. Lady, you drink too much. And you don't drink enough. You better catch up. I'm way ahead of you. You'll fall. I won't. She did. On her back, legs up from under her, landed flat, breathless next to him, her hair dancing as the bed springs wand like an orchestra tuning up. He leaned over and plucked each strand of hair from her face individually, an archaeologist carefully revealing a piece of precious treasure. The kid said, I am not an animal. She smiled up at him. I was kind of hoping you were. Her upside-down eyes glinted, placed his hand on her belly and let the warmth spread out from him into her body. She didn't move, kept staring at the ceiling. She had plenty of men touch her before, boy and how. Hawk Sinner who took her to the creek and read to her from the book of Genesis and told her if she held it a while it would get bigger, and guess what? It did. Three guys from Winslow who told her how come babies get cooked up and illustrated, one of them with a horde of pimples on his neck jumping out at her like frogs, the sweat and beer breath of a married guy named Ivan Ives. He quoted from the Bible, too. He hitched up his 44-inch pants as if to convince himself of the fact. Grass stains on your summer dress, carpet burns and hickeys, such a catalog. The infections and insertions, all kinds, always, pleading, threatening, all wanting it and then wanting you gone just as fast. Life is a receptacle. That's the way you know it's going to be. You learn pretty fast in this world. She thought, that wasn't love. Not the love he gave me. How could you compare? He who owned all he surveyed, who knew no other of his kind, who stood alone, Lord of creation, as far as the eye could see. He saved me from monsters took me in his hairy hand and wouldn't let go, wouldn't let the demons get me, even when they buzzed him and struck him with their beaks and claws and drew blood, carried me through the vitriolic swamp like a cannonball, my asthma smell making me heady and giddy as a child taking the first sip of champagne. He never let me fall, held me up to his face, carnage breath wrapping me like a gift, eyes black tunnels with a freight train coming, swatted like a petrodactyl, picked my clothes off one by one, peeled me like a grape, Examined me under the Hollywood chiffon, naked and white, to see me as I really was. Rolled me to and fro so he could look me over back and front. Blew up my hair. Gazed at me in wonder. Took me to his home in the clouds. And it wasn't about sex for once because sex was impossible. And that made her so, so safe. So, so happy then. A lost world, far away, but found. She reached down to the kid's hand and held it to stop it moving. She said, I was dreaming of him when his hand came through the window of my apartment. Shards of glass rained down over my bed and he hauled me out into the night sky. I thought I was still dreaming because I was floating. I hear the wailing traffic a million miles below, the police cars whining, and the thunder of his growl getting louder in his chest as he climbed and climbed. She stopped. Do you want to hear this? He didn't say anything. He didn't move. Hippolette's hunched over her. She said, I can still smell his hand. The big black leather couch, the smell of a hothouse, the Bronx Zoo, the 
or Mississippi Swamp of alligator gumbo, of nuts and palm trees and oil and dates, the blood of unsuspecting prey. And if I close my eyes, I can see my own reflection right now, frightened and amazed, pinned there in his big brown eyes. Her own unblinking eyes became baubles of tears, lost again, from the lost land to lost love, her perilous journey, now ashore where the rivers were brake lights and the cliffs were Wall Street, and the toucan calls were extra, extra. He was a wonderful thing. He was a god, she said. I couldn't escape then, and I can't escape now, because he died for me. I know he did. He placed me down in a place of safety so that I wouldn't get killed when they came in that last figure of eight. She shuddered and hugged the fur tighter around her. He knew what he was doing. He died for love, and nothing can ever be the same, because that day, the stream of bullets from the airplanes tore into his skin. I died inside, too. Her whole body wept. <clears throat> the kid touched her shoulder. She sat up briskly and unexpectedly and threw her arms around him and held him tight. First, he didn't know what to do with his hands, so he wrapped them around her. He could feel her ribs, her shoulder bones. He could feel her heart beating like a frightened bird you'd pick up in your hand, a damaged thing you'd want to save. He didn't want her to die. He wanted her to live. His fingers sank into her, shocking her. He held her by the shoulders and pressed his lips onto hers, into hers, forcing her back, head back sharply, mouth open, and his mouth over it hard. Sucking the breath out of her, he twisted her and pushed her down on her back on the bed. She was weak and frail. It didn't take a fraction of his strength to overpower her. Was he overpowering her? No, because she wasn't resisting in the least. She simply lay there before him, her cage of a chest rising and falling quickly through the shimmering silk of the nightgown to catch her breath, eyes flickering like a doe deer brought down by a predator, startled afraid. The kind of fear he thought that meant excitement and desire and longing and lust and not stop, not no. If she meant no, she would say no. Sirens and car horns battled in the street a million miles below. He knelt across her, colossus, or so he thought, men, taking her hand and putting it on his full erection, coiled and pressing against the cloth of his slacks. She didn't like to take it away and hurt his feelings. Without a sound, he furiously unbuttoned his jacket from the bottom to the top. In the dark, the golden orbs popped and flew. She watched the vest come up over his head, saw that his emaciated chest had hardly any hair on it, saw the smoothness, the pinkness of him. All she could think was, he shone. And his pants were down and her nightdress slid up in almost the same moment as his weight dropped down on her. His back made a bridge and he wriggled his hips till the tip of his thing breached her, went deep so fast she uttered a cry, dug her fingernails into his cold, doughy flesh. Not an expression of pleasure, she learned that the male of the species liked this kind of thing. Her knees dropped aside. Memories tumbled on her in a barrage of the past. A wall crumbling on top of her she couldn't stop. He gripped her face and pushed it back into the sheets, smothering her with fingers and thumbs as she struggled to gulp air down her throat. She grunted and sobbed. Another requirement, thinking, why? What? How? He was stabbing into her. A noble act. A heroic act, he thought. A redemption. A resurrection. Yes. Yeah. It was time she entered the world of the living again, and he was the man to do it, do it, do it. She would thank him. She would worship him. He'd be a god. She'd be renewed and whole again and perfect and pretty and famous and fucked. And just as she was thinking, oh, God, I wonder if it's possible to enjoy this, not the pounding sweat of it, the grunting bourbon breath of it, the slow, numbing death of it, the disgust of it, it was over. He felt the heat of fame washing over him like a reporter's flash bulbs going off, like Valentino's smile like a tuxedo on fire. And she only felt the weight of him, the dead weight of him. Not that she didn't want it, but not that she did. The Grand Canyon, like someone had hollowed her out with a big spoon, the Grand Canyon being full of trash, which was where she belonged, said Papa, because that was what she was. That's what she would always be, you hear me? But you asked me to, Papa. I believed you, Papa. <clears throat> he slid his penis out of her, Thinking that behind her closed eyes and smiling lips, she'd rediscovered love. Papa? If she was thinking of the ape's tree trunk finger pressing against her belly atop the Empire State Building, his ebony fingernail, a tarnished mirror, his caress so gentle for a big guy, she rolled onto her side and hugged herself as the chill of the room returned. They want the story, she thought. You know what the story is? The story is no man has ever come close to how I felt with him on that mountaintop. And that skyscraper, with him at my side, towering so high, roaring as they came out of the sun. 
Stand in front of it, said Papa. Look right into the camera, said Papa. Look frightened, said Papa. Beautiful, said Papa. Beautiful, beautiful. Would anyone scare me like Papa? Would anyone love me like Papa? Then she remembered the blood in her lover's fur, cloying, clammy, clotted, how he swayed from side to side in startled puzzlement, ageless, a sequoia hacked down, century collapsing, world destroyed, country eradicated, how she wanted to communicate but could not, how she wanted to forgive him but could not, save him but could not, how she wanted to be scared but fear was gone, his majesty, his highness, his gone, she turned over and saw the German boy's head against the pillow, thought of the giant's heads against the pillow of the sidewalk below, at the same angle, eyes unfocused in death. He rolled his head to her. It is what you wanted, yes? She paused before deciding to nod. He smiled and lit one of her cigarettes and sat up, could easily count his vertebrae, stretched over to pick up his vest and hotel staff jacket, dressed with his bare back to her as an airplane passed overhead with the monotone murmur of a disappointed voyeur. Oh, the pinkness of him. Her insides congealed. There's something inside out about the feeling. The nausea of stepping off a carousel, which was supposed to be an enjoyable experience but wasn't, yet the relief of being off. She didn't want to think about it. He handed her a cigarette and lit another for himself. She considered the action unbearably familiar and unbearably arrogant. She wanted to cry again. He stood up, his shadowy cock now shrunken and unattentive, dangling under the rim of his white jacket, peeked behind the drapes at the afternoon sunlight. Damn monkey. He chuckled as he buttoned up his collar. We socked him good, huh? She pulled the sheets around her in a nest, got on the bed on all fours and kissed her with puckered lips, which she endured. His grin was horribly self-congratulatory. She wondered how much of this had been his purpose, to screw the actress in 7205. Perhaps he'd announced it to the others as he picked up her tray. Perhaps he'd brag about it tonight in a bar. It had not been violent and hadn't hurt her, even as others had done. That was exactly it. She felt nothing, nothing at all. There was a gaping hole inside her where he'd been, and it was as if it hadn't happened at all. She knew with great clarity that that was the way it would always be from now on. She sat up in bed with her breasts and knees covered. Hope you don't lose your job. <clears throat> Screw my job, he said. He was a different person now, as they always were. It was never a surprise to her, but it always hurt. You know what they call me in the kitchen? Sauerkraut. This was supposed to be the land of the free, the home of the brave, of, of democracy and opportunity. I came expecting bright, clean Americans like bright, clean American automobiles, not sweaty Turks tweaking my ass and blowing me kisses, Italians barking and cursing at me, sticking my hand into boiling water for dropping a plate, Jew begrudgingly giving me my stinking wages at the end of the week. I expected New York to be, be like an elevator going up, always up, like the tall buildings, taller, higher, always higher, a place of money, place of glamour and power and gasoline, not foreigners and perverts. He, had his, he held his stomach in, puffing his hairless chest as he pulled on his slacks. My father sent me here to learn the hotel trade. One year, he said, you will learn more than in any university. He owns three of the biggest hotels in Munich, one in Frankfurt, two in Berlin. He tucked in his genitals. I always thought of the United States, it would be great. It is not so great. I expected a strong country. It is not strong. It is weak. A cripple like your president. You have no work, no good work. 13 million unemployed. Almost every bank is closed. People are losing their farms, homes, businesses. You have no money, no hope. We have movies, he snorted, which is what? Nothing but a sign of decadence. Treading his belt buckle, tugging it to the right hole and poking the pin through. I have read the history books. This is the way empires fall. Look around you from your high buildings and what do you see? The poor rewarded for doing nothing. Immigrants like me given opportunities of patriotic American struggle. Your country is sick and your men are standing by watching it happen. They're not fighting for what they value. They're not fighting for the future. They do not have a leader powerful enough to make things change. The actress held her cigarette vertically with her fingertips and blew on it so the tip glowed red. 
I'm going back home, not to Munich, to Potsdam, he said. I have an uncle there, an industrialist. I know there's always a job there open for me. Waited for a reaction from her, but all he saw was a long glowing red puff on her cigarette. The blue smoke hung flatly in the air between them. He crushed his own cigarette out on the plate of cold, untouched food. <clears throat> Come with me. A new life. A good life, he said. America. It is a place for dreams. But for some dreams you have to return to Germany, she said. I think there's a pot step up in St. Lawrence County. The kid laughed through his nose at that. Funny girl. Crazy girl. Stupid girl, said Papa. I'm serious. Come. It is beautiful. Beautiful. This way. To the camera. You're frightened. You're amazed. You're terrified. As the jungle drums began pounding in her heart, she imagined marrying this man. She could, so very easily. After all, he thought she was a star. He knew she was a star. You could see it in his eyes. He wanted that radiance of fame, of anecdote, of fable to fall on him. He wanted to be larger than life, too. He wanted to have her on his arm to show her off to bosses and officers and leaders, own her forever and have her obey his orders. She could see herself making a home with him, with him in some little cuckoo clock house with deer buck heads on the wall, with parties hunting boar or gnawing chicken legs and swilling beer. A trophy wife in Los Angeles. She a star. The parts would come knocking. No jungle pictures. Him a screenwriter or producer or both. Kids several. Nannies English. Stern but not too stern. He'd slap her occasionally, only when she'd deserve it. He'd have affairs, but then so would she. He'd find some younger, prettier version. So would she. The divorce would be expensive. She'd get the children and dogs. He'd get fat, bitter, and twisted, not necessarily in that order. You know, she said, I'm ready for breakfast now. He gave a broad grin, exposing his white, so perfect teeth. The parenthesis grin of a football player with a chiseled jaw. So American. And some good, strong, black American coffee, she said. He picked up the tray. You are on demand, yes? Yes. I love you. Everyone wants to love you, said Papa on the boat during the voyage to the island. And you know what? Let them. I know, she said. When the kid had gone and the door was closed and she was alone again in the room, she imagined her lover's gigantic skull, polished and white in the lobby of the Smithsonian, surrounded by a party of eager school children, and one of them smaller than his pointed teeth, the skeletons of dinosaurs keeping a respectful distance, the stare of eons in the space where his beautiful eyes used to be. She got out of bed and took a sheet of hotel notepaper from the drawer sitting with her reflection in front of her. Who was that woman with ribs in her chest you could count? Pale, gaunt, frightening. Why would anyone make love to that? She changed her mind and rummaged in her purse. She spiraled out her lipstick and wrote on the mirror, Thank you, Peter. Thanking him for making it clear, even if he wouldn't understand, couldn't understand, could anyone? Then she signed her name, her autograph. Maybe it would be worth something one day. See, Papa? I'm worth something after all. She had to hurry now. It only takes so long for the elevator to descend and return. Light flooded the room like a bomb blast, so bright she had to cover her eyes. When she opened them again, blinking, the surroundings took on a different aspect, washed with color anew. It seemed she was in a different hemisphere now, a different latitude. The world upended, transformed and rare. She felt no longer weak and fragile and worthless. She felt strong and excited and loved. The drapes fluttered like flags horizontal into the room. She shed the fur from her shoulders, gathered behind her feet. She knelt, then stood, bare feet, bare legs, goosebumps, white skin. A kid with the whitest skin in school, so poor she couldn't afford shoes. Silk dressing gown, silk, how she moved up in the world, clinging. A goldy sheen over the dark nipples and black V of her gender, invisible, looking down at Anch the, at, <clears throat> at Anch the way he looked down. Like her lover, she felt no fear. The unnatural blonde closed her eyes, doll eyes, drums in her chest, took one foot from the window ledge, then the other, as it had to be, falling like he fell. Seventy floors, sixty, fifty, and the numbers floated away, irrelevant like everything else. Wind raked through her frizzled hair, an ice blonde blur as she dropped, pinioned by her plummeting. All her senses peeled away to reveal a peculiar kind of freedom, 
strange kind of pleasure that life would not be there to torment her very much longer, and that was fine. That was okay. The euphoric surge enraptured her. Thank God for that. She prepared to enjoy her last few seconds on this earth, unencumbered by the future. All she could think of was the smallness of it all. An air rushed past. And his mighty hand might catch her even now. His mighty roar might yet echo in the canyon of the skyscrapers with the mighty beating of his chest, and he would save her. They would be together on the mountaintop, because it wasn't like the papers said, oh no. It wasn't beauty killed the beast. It was Romeo and Juliet. Of course it was. That was how all great love stories ended, didn't they? Like this. <laughs>